Think of a unit that operates far behind enemy lines, raids their stronghold and extracts high value targets and spearheads other more conventional military deployments. Who comes to mind? Maybe if you're British it might be the SBS or the SAS. For Americans perhaps Delta Force. What if I was to tell you that during the Zulu War of 1879 the British had a unit that performed all of these tasks and much more? Intrigued? Then stick around to find out more. Today, on the Redcoat History podcast and YouTube channel, I'm joined by the exceptionally knowledgeable Cam Simpson to talk about the Frontier Light Horse, an irregular mounted regiment raised by the British in South Africa. This is an edited version of our chat, so if you enjoy this and want to hear even more gory details about the unit and the men that served, then just search for the Redcoat History podcast on whichever app you use. Cam started off by telling me about the FLH's baptism of fire in February 1878 during the 9th Cape Frontier War. Their commander at that time was a man called Lieutenant Frederick Carrington. They first see action at a location known as um, Quintana, um, which is in the Transkei. And on the, this is on the 7th of February 1878. They're up at Ibiza and they're sent down with Captain Upcho, who's also another well-known Zulu war name. And they're with F and G companies, the 24th foot. There's some Fengu um, levies as well. And the force is numbering about 560 men. And they're at, they're at this um, defensive post at Quintana and about 5,000 of the Amacorsa start to approach the camp. They know that there's going to be a fight. There was a little bit of anxiety that they could not draw the, the enemy into fight, that they might see the defences and they might shy away and thus they're not going to close with them and destroy them and try and bring the war to an end. So um, Upcher and Carrington um, discuss the matter and what they decide to do is that they're going to send out a bit of bait and they pushed out the Frontier Light Horse, a company of infantry, out of the um, defensive positions, past a series of um, trenches that had been dug and concealed that were actually outside the perimeter. And they had, Upja had some infantry in there. And so they deployed the, the Corsa approach in two distinct columns and they take the bait and they launch an assault prematurely and the Frontier Light Horse and the Infantry com Company retire and, and basically um, the muzzles of the, the Henry Martinis put a stop to the, um, the Corsair assault and they lose about 200 men and then they break the assault off and they retire. The Frontier Light Horse pursues there's some front around our mounted police with them as well, and they also pursue and the Fengu levies flow up as well. And, and so essentially this army is routed at that stage. For the Frontier Light Horse, though, it's as their first action, it was quite successful. Um, they have two men wounded, and Carrington's mentioned in dispatches. Um, at, depending on the report you're reading at the time, they, they said that he was you know, exceedingly brave. Um, he displayed acts of valour, et cetera, in, in leading the Frontier Light Horse. Soon afterwards, a new commanding officer was appointed, a man who was to have a profound impact on the regiment. Replacing Carrington um, comes in Major Redvers Buller of the um, 60th Rifles, and he takes command on 22nd of April, 1878. He's 39 years of age, Bull has been in the army for 20 years. He's seen operations in China, Red River Expedition, and a shanty where he was wounded there. He knew Buller well from both his time up in the Red River Expedition and in a shanty, and also he knew uh, well, also Colonel Wood VC, um, who was in himself a, a celebrity in the army at the time. But more importantly, Buller knew soldiers well. He had 20 years of experience under his belt. He had his time up in Canada as well. He'd seen a different stamp of colonial soldier as well. And, he, you know, he really understood men. And what I read about him is that the men generally liked him as well. 
Um, what one man um, wrote at the time that they thought, you know, basically Buller's the man for us. That mutual respect between Buller and his new regiment was soon to grow as war clouds gathered again. This time the Zulus of King Petswaya were in the sights of the British authorities in South Africa. It was to be an incredibly busy time for the men of the Frontier Light Horse. Essentially, they're fighting the Zulu War from January to July 1879. And then there's this pacification operations, as generally termed, follow on, and that rolls through to September of that year. But really for the first seven months, for the frontier light horsemen, this is going to be really, really tough stuff. The patrolling is constant. It's relentless. You know, they're in the saddle all the time for seven months. It is day in and day out patrolling. And not short distance stuff, we're talking 40, 50 miles a day. At, at one stage, Buller even said the, the early stages of the build up for operations, he was in the saddle continually. The Frontier Light Horse are the first into the field, actually. They're first to patrol into Zululand. They, they start to go in to look for um, routes that the wheeled transport could take, the best way to get all the, um, the convoys in that are supporting these, these columns and all the different regiments. So it's something that's not often thought about, but um, but it's a it's a very real issue. You don't want to be taking you know, your wheel transport through rocky country or marshy country um, or areas that could be prone for ambush. So they'd look for the, the most likely route, and that that's pretty much what they're doing. But it's on the the twentieth of January that they're moving up towards the Zungwini Mountain, and it's really their this is their first fight of the, of the Zulu War. And they encounter about a thousand Abakalusi. Now, the Abakalusi are, um, are, are really vassals of the, of the Zulus under Ketswayo, and they're, they're situated up in the, the northwest of um, Zululand. Anyway, so they, they're approaching this Zangweni mountain, and there was a small homestead at the base of it, and they moved through and cleared it. They cleared it with. Um, a unit that needs to be mentioned at this point in time known um, Aces Burgers, Pete Aces Burgers. Now, he was a, a local farmer and there was 30 burgers that mobilised under him and they had a vested interest because their farms were nearby. And um, so they, they they were the local guides and talent and they worked closely with Buller and, and Wood. And every time the Frontier Light Horse went out, Aces Burgers were there as the local guides. So they they pushed through and they, they cleared... Um, this small um, homestead or a moosey. And um, th there's a little bit of fighting. A couple of men are, are, are wounded. And um, a captain, but Robert Barton at the Coldstream Guards, um, receives a powder burn to the face at the time. He stuck his head into a cave and an Abercalusi fired around at him and, he, and the powder burns got him. And so Barton, I'll just mention at this point in time, he joined the... Um, the regiment several months before, and he was effectively the second in command of the Frontier Light Horse. And he was a special service officer serving out in South Africa. After they cleared, cleared this village, they, they move on to some high ground on Sangrini Mountain, and the um, this thousand strong Abakalusi present themselves. Buller dismounts the men, they form a firing line. The horses are held in the rear. And they keep the Abercalusi at bay. They keep putting a, a steady fire down on these guys. And then they start to present themselves in fighting just like the Zulus. So they, um, they put the um, horns of the buffalo out to encircle around the frontier light horse. And they're in, in total, there's like about 250 men in, in each horn encircling and then at, at the chest, you, you've got the remainder of the Abercalusi. Now, Buller realises what's going on, and he's smart enough, and he was later praised for um, detecting this earlier on because not all men probably would have realised that what was going on and, and would have been surrounded. He calls it a day, mounts the men up, and then they start a fighting withdrawal, which goes over several miles back to the White and Pelosi River. And it's a fighting withdrawal, but... The takeaway for the day is they realise that firstly the Abercalusi are active, 
they're fighting just like the Zulus, and they mean business. They're up for a fight, and they're not going to shy away. So this is starting to present a new threat up in the area. Now, the, one of the troopers at the end of this day, they fought this fighting withdrawal, and in the end, they were still pursued by probably about 100 of the fittest Abba Kalusi that followed them over several miles. And when they crossed the river, they were still engaging them across the river. But a, a trooper wrote at the end of the day, the feeling of the men was trust God and, sorry, fear God and trust your horse. So having a horse during those times when you're being pursued by an Abba was, was vital. You did not want to be on foot. Even after Lord Chelmsford's number three column, the central column was badly mauled at Isandwana and forced to retreat back to Natal. Buller and the Frontier Light Horse continued their aggressive stance, taking the war to the enemy. On the 1st of February, they attacked another Abu Kulusi stronghold. They, um, they come in, they burn the huts, and, you know, um, today we'd, we'd look at this as, you know, highly aggressive. Um, the huts didn't need to be burned, but that was the policy at the time, go in and destroy everything and um, try and dis dislodge the, um, the Abu Kulusi and the Zulu as, mu as much as they could, and taking away the cattle as well. I mean, that's basically their economy um, that they're taking there. So they leave a troop on the saddle. The men descend in. There's a little bit of a fight. There's no casualties on the frontier light horse side. I've, I've read that the minor casualties on the Abercalusi. They get in, get the cattle. They torch the place, and then they're straight out, and then they get back as quickly as they can back to Kambula. And so this is, you know, from 4 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. at night. Now, whilst this is, um, you know, not a devastating blow to the Zulus, what it does demonstrate is that number four columns out there, they're operational. They've got reach into operational reach into Zulu-held territory, and they've also got a bit of bite to them. You know, they, these guys are, are meaning business and they're sitting out there. Also at this time, you had Prince Hamu defected to the British and the Frontier Light Horse were a part of um, re recovering him and bringing him back to Kambula. This was uh, Etwayo's half-brother, is that right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. And it was quite an amazing thing at the time. Um, but they took great care and attention in, in recovering a, as many of him and his people as they could. And then, of course, they, um, they served with the, the British on operations after that. But as tough as things had been, they were about to get even tougher. At the end of March 1879, the column commander, Sir Evelyn Wood, decided to attack Hlobane Mountain, a natural fortress well defended by those local war warriors of the Abakulusi. So they, they left Kambula camp on 24th of March and they head north and they conduct basically two days of sweeping operations through the Natombe Valley, trying to pick up in their dragnet any Abba Kalusi that, that is willing to offer any resistance. And, and it, they possibly covered more than 100 kilometres in those days, but I suppose when you're looking at patrolling schemes and making sure you're covering all the ground. There'd be a lot of moving backwards and forwards, but pretty much as the crow, crow flies, it's, they definitely covered about 100 kilometres. And they arrived back at Kambula camp on the night of the 26th. So they've had a good couple of days in the saddle. They're worn out and they're exhausted because it's been relentless for them. Since the operation started in January, it's, there's been hardly any respite. So that night they receive orders that there, there's going to be a reconnaissance in force to Shlaman Mountain. And it's like four or five um, kilometres long. At, at It's completely tabletop. At the widest point, it's about two kilometres wide. It's a very, very prominent feature. Um, it's used as a safe haven for cattle. There's a lot of homesteads around it. There's even some that were on, on top of it at that stage as well. This is now going to be a, a real attempt to get onto the mountain, sweep away as much of the livestock that they could find on the mountain. If they encounter the Abercalusi, close with them and try and destroy them. So this is what they're, they're trying to do. 
at 8 a.m. the following morning, which is generally a late start for the Frontier Light, or somebody must have hit snooze that day because generally I, I read that they they have a valley and they head out at 3, 4 in the morning, but it's a late start that morning. They've got 155 Frontier Light horse in three troops as part of a combined force of 1,320 men that weren't all mounted. There was a lot of it, probably about half was actually dismounted levies, which was a unit known as Woods Irregulars that were locally recruited. They moved out under Buller, who commanded the, a group that would assault the Upper Plateau. Then there was Colonel Russell, and he was tasked with the job with his mounted men to go and occupy the Lower Plateau, while Wood, now Brigadier General, was in the field and he was going to operate between the two forces. So the Frontier Light Horse, they move out and they take their time. They're, they're trying to keep the horses well rested. And what they do is they, they move to the southern side of, of the mountain deliberately in full view. And there's a couple of shots that's fired, but it's all completely ineffective. So they're not really letting letting on their intentions at the time, but the Abercalusi pretty much understand that they're probably going to try and, and get up that mountain again. So they off-saddle in full view of the, um, the Abercalusi up on the mountain. They light some campfires. And then in the, in the darkness, very, very silently, they saddle up and it starts to rain. In actual fact, it's real heavy rain. And they silently move off with those fires, um, they're hoping that they're going to stay lit in the rain. And the idea is they wanted to, the Abu Kalusi to them to think that that's where they're camping for the night. Initially, things went well. The British subterfuge worked and the mounted men began to advance up the mountain. They'd secured the plateau. Um, a trooper, the, the Frontier Light Horse, was guarding the gateway to that access point of the mountain. All the other mounted troops spread out and started to move to key positions while woods irregulars are on foot and they're sweeping the cattle. And the idea was that they would sweep the cattle across to the western side where they believed they could at least get the cattle down there, but they'd realised that you couldn't get horses, mounted men couldn't operate down there. That was the belief at the time. So they... They clear the livestock. The weather is clearing and the day is starting to look pretty good. They find some huts on the mountain that they torch these. And, of course, there's these plumes of smoke start arising that could be seen for miles away. But what they didn't realise at the time is that Russo detected them um, at 9 o'clock approximately nine o'clock, um, he's on the lower plateau, he's secured his objective. And his men are looking off into the distance, about five miles away they could see what appeared to be at the, at the time a, a dark cloud moving across the plain towards Schlaban Manor, but it wasn't a cloud, it was actually 17,000 Zulus, the same force that had fought at Izanwana, but that numbered 20,000 back then. So this is a sizable... Zulu army presenting itself. And the moving from the vicinity of, of an area called the Lion's Neck. The Abu Kalusi have also seen the Zulu army moving up to support them. They've now got invigorated confidence. There's about 3,000 of them in the area. And so they start to contest this access point. They realise now that they're going to cut off their access. And this, this is a, a smart move on behalf of Mbellini and it's too late. A troop can't regain that that lost um, neck there that they were holding, that lip, the access point to the, the mountain. So Buller then finds out about the Zulu army, and this is like at 11 o'clock, and this is when there's absolute calamity. What are we going to do? So the only way they're going to get up the mountain is that they're going to have to go west. The Abu Kalusi are now closing in and... There's firefights starting to break out everywhere and Buller realises, but we need to cut our losses, hang the cattle. If they get away, they get away, you know, with Woods Irregulars. 
and I need to get these men off the mountain quickly before that army closes with me and surrounds me and leaves me trapped up on this mountain. So well, it's essentially become just a case of trying to survive now. There's no other, there's, there's no, there's nothing else except survival at this point. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's it. And, you know, to keep any cohesion together um, was going to be difficult amongst panicked men. You know, bearing in mind um, th these all these different mounted troops are at various degrees of experience, dedication, I suppose, as well. So you're going to get some, some men that are going to create a bit of panic. And they push across to that... Um, what was deemed as an impassable, um, inaccessible pass, um, known as the Devil's Pass. Basically, it's 300 feet long. It's just covered in massive rocks. I mean, to go and you can't even, walking it's difficult. It really is hard to get down that on foot. You've got to watch, really watch your footing. Now, at the time, quite possibly there could have been a lot more soil around it, that erosion, what we see today, it probably presented itself a little bit different, but however, it was deemed impassable by mounted troops. So they amassed there 400 odd mounted troops. Um, they put in a, there's a rear guard blazing away at the Abu Kalusi and they start to push the men down. Bullets saying, just get down it. And as they're going down, horses are losing their footing and rolling. Um, Captain Cecil Darcy, one of the um, troop commanders, we'll talk about a bit later on, he even says that as he comes down, a rock comes down and tears the leg off his horse, you know. So this is really, really, really bad situation that they're in. The Abu Kalusi are closing with them. And they've, first of all, they've got a wall that needs to be broken down before they can get down onto this neck, which joins the upper plateau with the lower plateau. And at this stage, Russell's cleared off, by the way, so they've got no mutual support down there. So the Abba are moving around them there as well. And as they're descending, it's a crush. I mean, the best way to describe it for people to visualise it, maybe you'll put the photograph up on the, the video, but... It's basically a funnel that they're forced down and that you're coming in the wide end of the funnel where the, the troops are amassing. Then you're descending down this very, very narrow, um, rocky descent. And it's here that they sustain a lot of casualties. And at the base of it, the Abu Kalusi are closing. The Zulus are, are moving in as well, the, this 17,000 strong army. And they just start to, to close with these men and, um, you know, here they are with an, an equa. I mean, you don't want to be on the business end of that. And there's even descriptions of the men being on their horses and the Abercalusi coming under the horses and, and stabbing them, you know, from under the horses. They've also got the knob carry, which is quite heavy. And just a blow from this is enough to kill you. Yes, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the scene is just absolute pandemonium. But, but Buller in his, his typical leadership style and the other officers at, at the Frontier Light Horse and, and the other mounted regiments well, are trying to hold everybody together as well. But there was a fundamental mistake made that when the, the rear guard at the top was putting this fire down and, and keeping the Abba Kalusi away for some time, when they more of them presented, they actually thought it was Woods Irregulars and they ceased fire, but it was too late. The Abba Kalusi jumped on that and they started to rout the rear guard. And there, there was a, a lot of men killed, killed um, in the rear guard. And Buller even said in his report, I was the effect my stupid rear guard. Um, it basically left the gate open for them. And that's when the crush really happened down this descent. So they, they move down the Devil's Pass. They get themselves into some semblance of order, but it's every man for himself. I mean, the descriptions of the retreat back to Kambula camp, there's men operating as individuals, section, you know, half sections, four men, eight men, and then up to troop size. But it, it's basically, it's 
it's a route and it takes the men hours to get back to Kambula camp. Oh, don't worry, I'm just interrupting for a few seconds while I enjoy the wonderful South African sunshine. I wondered if you knew I was now a qualified tour guide for the most important battlefields in South Africa. That includes Isandwana, Rorksdrift, Spionkop, Majuba and dozens of others. You didn't know? Well now you do. I'm hoping to start running bespoke tours from 2023. So if you think you'd be interested then head on over to redcoathistory.com and sign up for my mailing list where you'll get a monthly newsletter and a free copy of my book on the Anglo-Zulu War. Anyway, enough of my rude interruption. You can get back to the story. I'm getting back to my sunbathing. But there's a lot of acts of gallantry. Um, you can imagine in this, this fighting, you know, there's absolute terror going on. Trooper Griggs of the Frontier Light Horse commits suicide. It, it's unknown that he was whether he was wounded or not, but Hutton records that in his diary that uh, Griggs had um, shot himself and... Presumably, he you know, obviously thought he's going to be overrun here and he'd rather kill himself than be stabbed with an Asegai. You know, so, so Buller, um, he was himself racing around and picking men up and um, he subsequently awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions that day. Um, Captain Cecil Darcy, who we mentioned earlier on, he, at one stage even Buller had picked him up. Um, Darcy was picked up by four different people. <laughs> he was picked up, then he he's taken to a, a place of safety, and then he himself is trying to, you know, get take control of the men and keep them together as a, a cohesive fighting group. Um, and then you know it gets hot again, and he has to be um, picked up and and moved out. So this constant picking up of um, dehorsed men it, it was very much the order of the day and. The bulk of the acts of gallantry are, you know, the Victoria Crosses um, and a couple of Distinguished Conduct Medals are sent around this kind of behaviour um, that day. And this is the way that the men operated. We've got Buller picks up his Victoria Cross. Um, Knox Leap, who was um, an Imperial officer um, serving with Wood, Woods Irregulars, and he picks up uh, Lieutenant Smith, uh, the Frontier Light Horse, and he picks up the Victoria Cross. And the two distinguished conduct medals to the Frontier Light Horse go to a William Vinicom and Robert Brown. So Robert Brown was an Englishman that was um, basically Buller's officer servant and had, had been with him for some time. Um, but he, he was a serving soldier in the Frontier Light Horse. For at the end of the day, I mean, this is a real severe blow. This is three officers and 26 men are, um, killed in the front of light horses, two wounded, of which C troop, C troop take the brunt of them. So, um, and of course, they get back to camp that night. Um, Buller actually goes out himself to try and um, locate as many men as he could. So the men are pretty dejected at this stage, and it rains that night, but the men are exhausted. Um, one individual said he just fell asleep in the rain. He'd replenished his um, bandolier with ammunition and just fell asleep, rain or not. He, he was sleeping. And Buller, incidentally, wrote about the Frontier Light Horse at that time, despite the day's events and the adversity that they faced, they actually performed well. He believed he was happy with the way that they managed to extract themselves and get out of that sticky situation. And as we said earlier on, you know, um, fear God and trust your horse. Well, this was very much one of those days. During the fight, Captain Barton, who had been in command of the regiment while Buller led the entire mounted element of the operation, was killed. That meant a new commanding officer was required. They appoint um, Captain Cecil Darcy to assume temporary command of the Frontier Light Horse, but it's confirmed pretty much soon after. And Dar Darcy was actually... Um, given the rank of commandant, being a local, whereas Buller and Barton were imperial officers and they were not given that rank. They retained their imperial rank. So Darcy was effective a, a captain, but he was um, also appointed commandant as commanding officer of the, the Frontier Light Horse. And he'd performed well. He'd, um, he did well the day before. 
um, despite losing his horse, and I think he even lost his carbine at one stage, he had to struggle to get that out of the saddle. Um, he even had a, a grab for his saddle at the, the Devil's Pass, and I think he abandoned it in the end. So he performed well. Um, it was even suggested that he he should have um, been awarded the Victoria Cross um, for his actions the day before, but it, it wasn't to be. It happens later on, though. So a little bit about Darcy. He's a New Zealander. His father had been serving in the British Army out there, and the family um, move out to um, the Eastern Cape when he's about nine years of age. After the drama of Hlobani, Buller, Darcy and the rest of the FLH didn't have long to wait to be back in action. That same afternoon, the main Zulu impi, the one that had won at Isandlwana, attacked the camp at Kambula. And it's about 1.30 in the afternoon when the right horn of the Zulu army appears to the north of the Lager. And Wood's got about 2,000 British in there and he's got six guns there. And ahead of this right horn is Sergeant Major Winterfelt, the chap that was with um, C Troop the day before and he's out with a patrol himself. And he comes galloping in just ahead of this right horn. So Winterfelt's had an interesting couple of days. Um, and, he, and he rides into the lager and it's discussed about, okay, what are we going to do? And um, like what they did back in um, Quintana, you know, in, in February 1878, it's decided that the mounted troops would go out with a heavy contingent of the frontier light horse and they're going to go to this right horn to prematurely um, commit themselves to battle. And this is what they do. So they, they open the lager up they descend out onto the, um, the open field and they start to engage the right horn and they, they take the bait and there's a fighting withdrawal all the way through. Now, as soon as the, the right horn comes under effective fire from um, Woods Infantry of the 90th foot, you know, they're basically pinned down and they don't move all day. For the remainder of the day, they remain checked, this right horn, and essentially... After a number of a series of attacks and attempts to close with the lager and um, the Zulu, Zulu army is pretty much um, defeated by 5.30 and, it, and it's all over. So at this point in time, the, um, the mounted men are ordered by Buller to, to mount up and... Um, and as, as he even said in his report, he said at, at that stage, about 5.30, it was a matter of, um, it was stand to your horses, mounted men, we are up and at them. And then they pursued the, um, the Zulus right into the night. But for the Frontier Light Horse and the remainder of the mounted men, they hadn't forgotten what had happened the day before. And Hutton wrote in his diary that the... Um, as the Frontier Light Horse pursued, and Hutton was a part of that, that men were calling out, remember yesterday, they picked up the, the Zulu Asegais, according to Hutton, and they were using them like swords with great effect in his so words. So essentially sort of swinging them like you would a sabre. Yeah, I mean, that's the impression that you get from the, the diary, and they just pursue them as far as they could until they, they just call it off, and it's well into the, 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 um, the night time. But when you, you look about it from the front here, Light Horse, as I said earlier on, this is the end of a six-day epic where they've been in the saddle, they've had two pitch battles to fight, they've lost a lot of men, they've obviously a, a lot of emotion, they're operating on light scales, limited food, the horses were starting to get knocked up as well. So this was tough stuff. Over six days, they, they endured this, and it was a real test. I mean, one of Buller's biographers said that it was only a guy like Buller that could have held the men together in such trying circumstances. It, was a, it really was something else, and, and it's often overlooked. As I mentioned earlier on, you know, Kambula and Taban are looked upon as two separate battles, but for the men of the Frontier Light Horse, it was the end of a six-day operation pretty much covering vast distance, 200 miles or 200 kilometres at least, and two significant battles. 
Despite this crushing British victory over the Zulus, the war still had a long way to go until it was over. Lord Chelmsford put together a bigger, more powerful army for a new invasion. Once again, the FLH were at the forefront. The patrolling goes on. There's a lot of real long, long range stuff. And it's pretty much patrolling with the objective of, um, once again, identifying ground that could be used for the wheeled transport. So as the, the second invasion occurs, that they, um, the wheeled transport have got routes that are, it, it's going to not impede the columns. They're not going to get stuck. They're not going to have protract, protracted convoys going over miles because of transport stuck, et cetera. They'd also be identifying areas where they could lager up. And also um, with this second invasion, as you know, they established a number of forts all the way along, and so they protected their lines of com communication. By the beginning of July, the British were within striking distance of the Zulu capital, Alundi. There was to be one more major battle. 4th of July, Alundi's fort. But the day prior to that, um, the flying column is active. They're out there with Chelmsford's um, army that, that invades. I think Ian Knight calls it a juggernaut, and that describes a massive army that, that moves into Zulu land and is heading straight for Alundi to essentially close and destroy the Zulu army. Now, the day prior, Buller's takes, takes some of his, um, his mounted men and he crosses the White Umfalozi River and they're cantering in towards um, Alundi itself and they're trying to understand what the Zulu dispositions are, where, how many of these um, massive homesteads and kraals are occupied, do they see the Zulu army, what's there, and to identify an area where um, Chelmsford can fight this fight. Where, where is he actually going to have the fight to identify that ground? And as they're approaching, Buller sort of detects that there's something not right here. And so he orders the mounted men to halt and loose a round of, um, from the saddle. And so they, they stop, they fire off a volley, and then, of course, he was right. All of a sudden, the Zulus emerge and they're, they're almost all around them. They close really quickly. And as they're extracting themselves and they're doing one of these classic fighting withdrawals, there's a number of casualties. I think for the day it ends up with three killed and four wounded, but there's a number of men dehorsed. And then Cecil Darcy goes out and he attempts but, but fails to pick up a, a trooper, but it, He's almost surrounded and, and has to extract himself and fight his way out of um, there's been the Zulus that are surrounding him. Then you've got um, Sergeant, Sergeant Edmund O'Toole of the Frontier Light Horse and he's out there with, um, with Beresford, a, um, an Imperial officer that's serving with, with the flying column. And these men are all trying to pick up or succeed in picking up dehorsed men and Essentially, it results in Darcy being awarded the Victoria Cross. Um, we get Beresford gets a Victoria Cross, but only accepts it if O'Toole, who was with him, gets a Victoria Cross as well. So that, that was, in the, in the terms of the Frontier Light Horse, quite a significant day for him as far as um, recognition of the, um, the various acts of gallantry that are before Afford, I'm sorry, performed by the, the, the men in the regiment. But needless to say, over the, the previous months, there would have been many acts of bravery that um, go unrecognised. But despite its exceptional service and those many acts of valour, it was decided that the regiment would be disbanded. Perhaps a clash of personalities between Commandant Darcy and the new British Commander-in-Chief, Sir Garnet Wolseley, was to blame. I, I gather that Wolseley didn't, really liked Darcy. When he was awarded him, physically awarded with the Victoria Cross in Pretoria, he pretty much said, and he, he does say in his diary, that it was really a, not a very deserving VC as the man that he tried to save. Um, didn't he, he died. He didn't save him. Um, so he, And then he also made a comment there at a dinner one night, and, very, you know, we all know that Wolves in his diary is very critical. He said that Darcy was 
continually talking about himself and was talking like he's the only person that's ever been under fire. And, you know, Woolsey was saying he hadn't realised that we'd all been under fire, we'd all been through trying ex um, experiences. So I gather that he, he didn't like him and possibly that had something to do with the decision to take them back to Peter Maritzburg and disband them. Their, their breakup is really tragic. They come into town and there's, like, there's no respect, there's no pomp and pageantry, there's no addresses and well done. It's pretty much they come into town. Captain Christian at that stage um, He's left in, in charge. Darcy pushes on down to down to Durban later on pretty quickly, um, as do a few of the other officers, and they're just abruptly broken up. And the men were really annoyed because they got less than a month's pay. It was a sad ending for an exceptional unit. But is it fair for me to call them the special forces of the Anglo-Zulu War? What does Cam think? Yeah, I suppose if you had to put a, put a label on a unit that was closely identified with special forces as we sort of know it from post-World War II or World War II onwards. Um, definitely you could, you could class the Frontier Light Horse as being of that, that ilk. But going back to their original intention, their purpose of being raised, you know, back in 1877 and, and 78, no. Um, it, it was something that really just evolved. You know, as you suggested as well, these special tasks like the the Ever Colosini raid. I mean, what a fantastic initiative! You know, this is eleven days after Izanwana, and let's go and launch an offensive hit, you know, offensive operation that was fundamentally hit and run. Get in there and get the job done. Strike a blow, more of a psychological blow than anything, and get out. And then, of course, they're sent into bring Prince Hamo out, and this is in occupied terrain, enemy-dominated terrain. So they go in and they extract Hamu. That's specialised as well. Now, at the time, I'm struggling to think of any other unit that was agile enough and probably had the numbers to do this and to pull this kind of um, work off. And Chelmsford actually acknowledged the fact that they were quite special. So if anyone wants to go into real molecular detail about, you know, both the men and the operations of the Frontier Light Horse, you've got this book, The Frontier Light, Light Horse in the Anglo-Zulu War, 1879. I'm holding it up now for those who are listening only. It's a bloody brilliant read. Even my dad's been reading it while he's been visiting me just now. If anyone wants to get a hold of this book and learn more, can they get it? Yeah, they can. So the best place to get it is um, David, Dave McClellan out at Select Books. He can send them across the world any couriers. I mean, he's highly efficient, so he's the best person at the moment to get it from. Those that are those copies that are surviving. So is that that select books in Cape Town, and presumably people can contact them via their website. Yeah, exactly.